All right, let's talk about how to close million dollar deals. Um, I've been busy, haven't been on social much for a while. Ah, some people are wondering where I went. Busy these days, man. Busy. Being a social media influencer is not like an end game for me. For a lot of people, that's like the end game is like to be a social media influencer is the goal. For me, it's a means to an end. Um, for me, you know, I've got a singular goal, which is like how to live the good life. What's the definition of good life? Health, wealth, love, happiness. Nowhere in there is trying to be a big social media influencer or part of the good life. It may be a a um, dynamic that can lead to the good life, but in general, for most people, I actually think um, being a social media influencer will lead to the bad life. I've seen that. Just like a lot of celebrities, and you look at most celebrities, they end up in rehab, you know? So anyway, let's talk about closing million dollar deals. Um, now, for those of you just starting out, that might feel like an overwhelming goal, like million dollars. So let's start with starting out a thousand dollar deal or a ten thousand dollar deal. The singular skill that you can learn that's the most statistically proven way to create long term wealth in your life is to know how to close deals and sales skills and business skills. Everything else is kind of a subset to that. If you look at somebody even like Elon Musk, he's a good, you don't see this because he mostly talks about SpaceX and Tesla, but he knows how to close deals. He didn't start PayPal. He merged PayPal. He closed a deal to merge PayPal, right? Into somebody else's brand that had started PayPal. Um, when you look at, you know, um, Tesla, he didn't start Tesla. What did he do? He bought Tesla from two brothers who had started Tesla. So he's a deal maker. Now, recently, I just bought bodybuilding.com. Somebody said SMMA course changed my life, Ty. Well, good. Um, someone said, is Grant Cardone the best closer in the industry? Um, I don't know who's the best. What are we going by? In real estate, he's certainly one of the one of the best ones out there. But there's others. There's others playing in silence, man. Just remember, like, no matter who you see online making money, there's some dude or woman making money in silence. So, you know, um, somebody said, Josh said, I don't think I'll ever close a million dollars, but I'll listen to you. Okay, so let, let's talk about it like this. Here's the three elements you have to understand. First, you have to understand the cognitive biases on how the human brain works. So the human brain is a decision-making tree, okay? So just think about something simple that every species, not even homo sapiens, not even humans, um, they reproduce. So there's mating decisions, right? So if you look at a rhinoceros, at a whale, let's take mammals for it, not talk about other, uh, you know, let's, not, let's, let's stick with mammals at least. So lions, elephants, humans, you have a decision-making tree. When a woman meets a man or a man meets a woman, whatever gender, I don't want to get into that conversation. Uh, you have a decision-making tree that quickly happens. So you're looking how intelligent, how physically fit they are, and what's the long-term reproductive benefit. Now, this all happens in the subconscious. This is the key thing to remember. So I'm reading a great book by a guy named Jung, Carl Jung. He was from the Switzerland. He's one of the great psychologists of all times. And he mostly was interested in the subconscious of humans. He wasn't concerned with when a dude goes on Tinder or a woman's on Tinder, how they make a decision to swipe right or left, okay, um, in the conscious mind. So the conscious mind makes a guy go, ooh, this girl has big boobs, or a woman says, this this guy's tall, I'm attracted to him. Um, the subconscious mind is like this engine that's just purring in the background. It's like it's a continual autonomic system reaction, like your heart beating, your blood pumping, this brain is going and it's doing its own calculations that have nothing to do with societal benefits, nothing to do with societal benefits, right? Uh, societal, societal beliefs. Every hundred years, society changes in what it believes. Like, so for example, you know, in the 1700s, I'm reading a great book called Killing England by Bill O'Reilly. It's the story of the American Revolution. Dudes were wearing wigs. White haired wigs was like the thing and dudes were wearing pantaloons or whatever. And that was sexy. 
okay, to women. <laughs> a dude who wore a wig. It's like, oh, this guy's got the great wig. But what was happening in the subconscious mind? What was happening in the subconscious mind is a woman was assessing this man's resources, both physical, intellectual, and actual monetary. And a wig was a great sign of that. If you could afford a good wig, you were a dude that probably, um, A, had above average resources, which is correlated with higher IQ, which is highly heritable. I don't know if you know what the term heritability means, but certain traits are passed on to children. So for example, the most heritable traits are your height, your eye color, your hair color, the melanin in your skin, but IQ is very heritable. So throughout history, women and men have assessed the IQ. And in general, people marry people within one to two standard deviations of their own IQ. And men often try, and if you talk to scientists like Dr. David Buss, men unfortunately often try to get women who are slightly less IQ than them. And this is something you hear a lot about in kind of gender debates where women say, oh, men don't really want a smart guy, a woman. Well, there is some truth to that if you look at the science. I'm not saying that's good, but that is the reality we live in. And the real reason is, is men oftentimes throughout history have wanted to be smarter than the woman so she they can slightly manipulate or control her would be the term. Okay, I'm just, again, this is not my opinions. This is the dis- opinions of somebody who wrote the Harvard textbook. Now, he could be wrong. Dr. Buss's science could be wrong, but it's the best bet we have right now. So I'm going to run with that. So when a woman looks, a woman wants a high IQ man because in general, she knows her children. It's highly heritable. Their children, children, male or female, will have a higher chance to be a high functioning at a cognitive level human. So when she saw the wig in the 1700s, her brain, her subconscious did all this math. Her conscious mind did none of this. Nobody sits there and goes, hmm, I wonder if this wig means this person has extra ability to garner resources like a chimpanzee, you know, 750,000 years ago before Homo sapiens or modern day Homo sapiens, right? No, it's just a subconscious reaction. And it shows to a woman or a man in this feeling of attraction. Oh, I'm more attracted. You hear people say, oh, I went on a date with this person. And I just vibe with them. That's all subconscious mind happening very quickly. Now, how does this relate to closing deals? It's the same thing. I just bought a company called bodybuilding.com. It's a fa- it's a company that does nine figures last year. So this is a company doing more than $100 million in revenue. I bought it about a year and a half ago. Uh, sorry, a month and a half ago, not a year and a half ago. Um, I bought Pier One. I bought Radio Shack. I, I buy businesses as well as start them from scratch. When I'm looking to close a deal and I'm sitting in a room with people, I'm trying to go, What's the lever in this person's subconscious, but not their conscious mind? Now, sometimes the lever of closing a deal is something simple, like be on time and wear a suit. Some humans that are sitting at the other side of the table negotiating with you, they are people who really care about simple things. Punctuality, how well your hair is groomed. You can see my hair is a little messy right now. So I might not show up like to a complex business deal like this, but I need to read the room. Okay. I need to read the room. And for you to be able to close a thousand dollar deal, a $10,000 deal or a million dollar deal, the biggest skill you could have. Number one skill that you can have is can you read a room? Now, A lot of people think the secret to reading a room is something simple like body language. Have you ever heard this conversation on body language? Like, oh, if somebody leans forward, they're more interested in you. Or if somebody speaks slower, if somebody has open hands, if somebody, uh, there's people who say, you know, if they're mirroring you, that means they're, those things I will tell you are probably about 20% of reading the room. If you actually want to know how to read a room to close million dollar deals, more importantly, is you start, you got to close, you have to attempt to close a lot of deals because you'll start noticing pow, uh, you'll start noticing patterns in human behavior. So I classify humans as four main personality types. Personality type one, okay, personality type one is what I call the um, uh, practical person. The second one, is the action. So I call this the PACE system, P-A-S-E. 
Okay. Practical action, social, emotional. Give me one second. I'm going to do one thing. And I'm going to explain this system. I kind of developed this years ago to train my salespeople. All right, let me go. I'm going to, I forgot to turn on TikTok here. TikTok. Okay. How to close million dollar deals. By the way, you got to know how to label things. You got to know email marketing. This is all the same thing. Email marketing is actually closing deals on autopilot. I was just looking at one of my brands is making a million dollars a month from emails we send out easily more than that. But let's just say one of them does about a million dollars a month in email. You got to know how the subject line, the subject line is your opening and your closing to a deal. So you have to, email marketing is a whole nother level. I was talking about how to close in-person deals. Let me just push this. Come on, Go live here. Damn it. Why does TikTok have a damn limit on how long many characters I can do? Closing million dollar deals. Set your cover. I don't want a damn cover. I'm just gonna go live. Damn it. Okay. Go on live. All right. What's up, Twitter? I mean, uh, TikTok. My bad. I'm live on a couple other. I'm live on Instagram and Speakeasy. So how to close million dollar deals. First, there's different rules if you're closing in-person deals versus if you're closing like email deals. Now, automation um, of deal making, like I said, I buy a lot of brands. I bought bodybuilder.com, I bought Pier One. I'm sending almost 900 million emails a month across all my brands. Now, the problem with email marketing, there's good and bad about email marketing. The good thing about email marketing, okay, is that it works while I'm sleeping. One of my brands is doing about a million dollars a month just in email revenue. And as I do that, I'm sleeping, I go to sleep tonight, it's gonna generate money. The downside of email marketing is it's never try to close a million dollar deal on email. I'm gonna tell you one of my tricks, I go fly out to any single human. When it's a million dollar or more deal, I'm working on a deal right now that's, it's a public company, so I, I can't say much about it, but this is a deal that's tens of millions of dollars to buy this company, okay? I've been in seven cities in seven days. I went from Puerto Rico, Boston, Boston, Minnesota, Minnesota. I just touched down in Minnesota, had a meeting at the private airport, and then went to San Francisco. Then I went to Phoenix, Dallas, Utah, um, and Puerto Rico again. So the downside of bigger deals, like million dollar deals, or even hundred thousand dollar deals or thousand dollar deals, you don't try to close them on email. What you use email for is to like close hundred to thousand dollar deals. Email will work for that medium. I love that most people, there's people out there trying to close million dollar deals on Zoom. Don't do that. <laughs> Someone said you look exhausted. I am tired. That's why I'm in bed. Thank you for noticing. Um, so modalities of sales and closing. So modality one is via email. Modality two is versus like Zoom or FaceTime. Modality three is audio phone call. Modality four and kind of the king alpha modality is in person. I'll fly anywhere if the deal's big enough. Like I said, when I bought Radio Shack, which is a big brand, at its peak, Radio Shack was doing 15 billion global revenue, okay? I went, the owner is a billionaire guy who lives in Utah that I bought it from. And guess what? I flew to Utah. <laughs> and if the dude isn't available uh, except at eight in the morning, I show up at eight in the morning. If they want to meet at four in the morning, I'm waking up at four in the morning. So it's super important you understand the modalities. Um, somebody said, bro, you're broke. <laughs> maybe, maybe. People are always trying to figure out. By the way, I just bought networth.com. I'm going to launch this damn website. I'm going to compete with Forbes uh, because, you know, I bought networth.com from um, HP, Hewlett Packard. It was for sale and I, and I bought that thing. And um, I'm going to make networth.com literally into a brand where you can look up people's net worth. I'm going to actually use lawyers to verify people's net worth. So if any of you all want to have your net worth verified, you, you can't believe how many entrepreneurs literally 
are excited to have their net worth verified. Like me, I'm always trying to have my net worth unverified. Like I don't even want people to know. My advice to all of you, it, <laughs> when you're not, when you don't have much money, you want people to know your net worth. Put it that way. When your net worth like a million bucks, you want everybody to know it's a million bucks. When it starts to grow a little bit, it's all downside uh, about if people knowing your net. Your, you know what? First time I moved to Be uh, Beverly Hills, true story. I had a maid agencies, like different agencies we were testing. Um, and a maid came, worked for me for one afternoon, and then made a claim on health ins against health insurance that she slipped on a banana peel. No joke. Now, of course, it got dismissed because what the fuck? Nobody slips on a banana peel. But that's the point for all of you who aren't there yet and you're super excited about having your net worth go up online, good luck. You will have fun with that. Um, but I bought networth.com. Did you know there's 163 million searches or 133 million searches a month on a person's name and the word net and the phrase net worth. So it's pretty cool. I bought uh, networth.com. So I'll be launching the site in about two weeks. I've been busy. Anyway, back to closing deals. So first thing you have to know is the modalities. When in doubt, go in person. Get on an airplane. Don't be lazy. You triple the chance of closing a deal when you go in person. Okay. Abel said, Ty, don't tr tell girls your net worth. They'll try to steal your money. Depends on what kind of woman you hang out with. So more importantly, be picky on who you hang out with, man. Be picky. I heard Chris Rock say, he, you, I don't know if he was telling the truth, but he said he liked to pick up women in a, in a garbage truck for the first date. And then she'd be like, he's like, oh, I was just coming from work to pick you up. He's like, if she liked him after the garbage, I guess he did that when he was, before he was super famous. So buy yourself a garbage truck, pick up everybody on the first date. What's up, Lumi? Oh, are you? Oh, I know somebody. Yeah, that's somebody I know. I haven't talked to him in a long time. Okay, so I want you to know modalities in person is most powerful. Second most powerful is probably Zoom or video chat. The worst modality, do not close big deals by email. I am telling you, I forbid my lawyers because I lawyers love to negotiate by email. I get so pissed at them. Like I've spent in the last couple of years, I've spent like 10 million on deal making. Maybe not 10 million, 5 million on lawyers closing deals. They always want to email and I'm like, stop fucking up my deals. Okay. So number two thing, once we get past modalities, back to the subconscious mind, I got distracted because TikTok came on here. Forget the conscious mind. Stop asking people stuff. Observe their behavior. Okay. Stop asking. Most people ask too many questions versus make more observations. For me, I'm literally addicted to observing people, especially when it comes to deals. So I'm looking for things. For example, I'll give you an example of something I look for. I will look for how quickly they answer me back. That is a subconscious signal to their interest. So I don't necessarily ask somebody, hey, if I fly out to you for a deal, are you ready to do a deal? No, nah, that doesn't work because oftentimes, like Jung said, the famous psychologist from Switzerland, okay, he died in, I think, the 1940s. Um, if you've ever heard the Meyer Briggs test, like ENTP, INFJ, all that stuff, oh, it's my live skipping. Can you all hear me on TikTok? Thumbs up if you can hear me. All right. They got the, the comments lag by like 30 seconds. It's funny. Okay, so it's better now. Good. I'm making the observation. I send somebody a text. Do they message me back in 10 seconds? Now I know subconscious and conscious this person is ready to do a deal. OK, I might send them an email, but not with the goal to close the deal by email. I send the email to see how quickly they reply back. OK, that's the game. Oops. Somebody's trying to call me actually on a deal. I'm trying to close a very complicated deal as we speak right now. Crazy complicated. It's a publicly traded U.S. company. So. Um, become the master of observation 
don't think it's so simple to body language is overrated as a reading tool. Um, I'll, okay. Now then we go to the next thing. I got to go in a little bit, but I'll give you something really powerful. What vocabulary do they choose? So for example, I'm listening to words. If somebody says something, you ever heard of a Freudian slip? Who knows what a Freudian slip is? It's a Freudian slip. Anybody know? Okay. Yes. So a Freudian slip, Sigmund Freud came up with this concept that the subconscious mind would slowly like, for example, instead of saying, let's say a woman likes a guy instead of, and his name's Derek, instead of saying Derek, she'd be like, Hey Dick. And that means she's sexually attracted to him. That's an example of a, <laughs> that's a kind of a stupid example, but there's an example of what Sigmund Freud considered a Freudian slip. Instead of calling the guy Derek, they call him Dick, right? Because that's what's on her mind, theoretically. Okay, now the concept of Freudian slips has been, I'm not sure modern science completely agrees with the concept of Freudian slips and missteps because sometimes people misspeak just because they're nervous. Um, but there's some truth to it. What I more look at is what's their phraseology. So phraseology means something like this. Hey, Ty. So you want to buy my company? I've been thinking a lot about the offer you made to me and my wife on buying our company we started 10 years ago. Now, stop right there. Notice some of the the psycho the, the um, phraseology they they did. I've been thinking. Now, I take them at face value. Oftentimes, people who are more slow ponderers, they say the word thinking. Now, it sounds overly simplistic. You might go, oh, well, does that really mean they're thinkers? More likely than not, they're what I would call a P in my PACE system, P-A-S-E. So I would say, if they said the phrase thinking, I've been thinking a lot about this. I'm starting to understand that subconsciously the vocabulary is conveying to me that this is a slow pondering step-by-step -step decision maker, non-hasty, and I'm going to have to give them time. And if I put pressure on them, it's going to backfire on me. I heard that person say, me and my wife have been thinking about this deal to buy the company we built 20 years ago. Now I know subconsciously this person really is counting the time value of their money. Like we've been slaving away over this for 10 years or 20 years. <laughs> What's up, Grant Cardone? Grant, <laughs> Grant said you're so sexy. Grant, I can always count on you for a fun uh, comment here. Somebody was just talking about you. Is Grant Cardone the greatest closer? You think you're the greatest closer, Grant? What do you say? Let me, let me invite him to come on the call. Let's see if he wants to go live. Wow. Greatest in the world, bro. What's, are you the greatest? <laughs> You're so sexy, bro. I was sitting here eating. I'm eating dinner. We're in Vegas planning out our next growth conference. And I saw you come live and I was like, oh my God, he's so sexy. I got to stop what I'm doing. <laughs> do you ever have long hair, Grant? What's that? You ever have long hair? Oh yeah, yeah. I used to have long hair. Yeah, I used to be Herculean. I got a wife. She said, "Hey, cut your hair. There's only one of us that's going to be a woman." <laughs> hey, I just want to say hi to you, man. Be great, brother. I love you. Yeah, I. Sorry, I couldn't come to the mastermind. I heard good things, dude. I, I, I told everybody. I said, "Ain't no way Ty's going to show up. Ty's not going to come. He's not going to show up. He's telling you he's going to show up. He's not going to show up." Grant, I went, I'm working in the public. I went to seven cities in seven days that week. I went Puerto Rico, Boston, San Fran, Phoenix, Are you Dallas. Complaining, complaining or bragging? Huh? Bragging or complaining? You bragging or complaining? Explain it. But I saw good things. Everybody told me it was a good. I saw you were bartending, man. How was the bartending? Dude, I'm a good bartender, bro. Like, I got, you know, Tom Cruise taught me how to be a bartender. Is that true? Hey, hey, be great. Let's catch up. All right, I'll talk to you. Peace. Grant Cardone's a funny dude.
I I was supposed to come to, he had a mastermind, but I literally couldn't make it. So what's up everybody from the Grant Cardone group. We're talking about how to close million dollar deals. I've been buying companies, just bought bodybuilding.com. I bought, you know, Radio Shack, Pier One. And I was talking about the modalities of closing. Who here is a real estate closer? Who here is a real estate closer? Because I know there's a lot of people following Grant that do real estate stuff. So I'll tell you this. If I was a realtor or in the real estate game, I would start reading literally every single real estate uh, sorry, every single psychology book I'd read for every one real estate book, I'd read one book on psychology. And I'll tell you, within a year of studying psychology as a true student of practical psychology, you should be able to almost double your net worth in real estate. Because real estate is the ultimate example of a business where sales skills turn into net worth quickly. Because at the end of the day, real estate is relatively efficiently priced, right? If you're looking at multifamily, if you're looking at raw land, I buy farmland, it's all the same game. A lot of people are looking at the same piece of property. I bought a brand called Dress Barn um, in 2019 before COVID. It was doing about $700 million in revenue. It's a female clothing line. And I was the second highest bidder on that deal. And they sold it to me, the investment bank, because I knew how to say and uh, convey a message that was appealing, even if I was the second highest bidder. So you can actually save millions of dollars on deals by being likable, by being somebody that's trustworthy, by people feeling like you're going to actually close the deal when most people that they sign a deal that ends up not closing. And I do that all through. Some people ask if I do NLP, neuro linguistic programming. I've never actually studied neuro linguistic programming. Some people swear by it. Um, what I find that works better is this concept of how do I read a person? When I read the person, I put them into four categories practical, action, social, emotional. If I know they're a practical person, I go slower in closing, I give them time, I don't put pressure on them. If they're an action-based person, I put a lot of pressure on them because they respond to that. If they're an S, that's a social person, then you know what I do? I don't even talk business. I go out, get a beer with them, go out to a club, go to a bar, go to a restaurant, take a walk. Social people are not motivated by logic, by facts, by money. They're mostly motivated by, do they like this person? So if I'm dealing with an S, it's a social person, that's my game. If it's an E, E is for emotional, then I'm really trying to understand in an empathetic way. There's some people that don't want you to be empathetic. I'm telling you that. Some of you are emotional people and you can't fathom that there's some people that don't want you to be emotional with them. Some people who won't respect you in a deal. So- Somebody said, how do folks not already know this? Okay, let's go a little more advanced. Who here has ever closed a deal for more than $10 million? Is there anybody on this call? I know there's a lot of people from Grant Cardo. Anybody closed, not the value of the property, where you wired $10 million to somebody or 20 or 30. Do we have any big dogs in here that you've wired your side, not a bank or whatever? What's the largest deal anybody's done? What's my Myers-Briggs? I'm an ENTP. Somebody said two of my favorite psychology books. Um, probably the best psychology book on earth is Dr. David Buss's book called Evolutionary Psychology. It's the textbook that they use at Harvard and Yale. Uh, the second biggest, best psychology book is probably, there's a book called Influence by Cialdini. There's another, or C. Aldini, some people say. Um, there is a book by any book by Daniel Kahneman. There's a new book called On Regrets. I think it's by Daniel Pink. There's a tremendous amount of psychology books that I like. But Dr. Buss is the place to start because he has probably the most cutting edge psychology on what motivates humans. Now, a lot of people like Jordan Peterson. Um, 
has become really popular. Anybody a fan of Jordan Peterson here? He's really controversial. He's kind of, I think he's linked up with Ben Shapiro at um, the Real Daily Wire. Those guys are crushing it over there. I was on the on Ben's show a couple times. He was on my show. Um, Jordan Peterson, his books are more, I'm not sure if they were cite. They're not deal closing books. There's a good book that's not so much psychology, but it's called Poor Charlie's Almanac. It's by Charlie Munger. That's a very compelling psychology book. And it talks about the cognitive biases of the human brain. Someone said, who likes Jordan Peterson? Who doesn't? He's pretty controversial. About half the world loves Jordan Peterson and half the world doesn't. Um, I'll tell you somebody who's really good at psychology that people don't realize, okay, is Elon Musk. Elon Musk, to me, is more of a psychologist than an entrepreneur. Now, he's both, obviously, but he's very powerful, in understanding. And I once had a long conversation with Elon Musk. It's somewhere on my Instagram. You can see the video. It was in Hollywood. We were at an event and I started talking to him about social media. And I can just tell you this, this was a 30 minute conversation. I will, what I'll tell you is he thinks much more systematically than people realize, you know, this whole Twitter deal. Remember how he made an offer to buy Twitter And then he backed out of it and he sold some Tesla shares in anticipation, blah, blah, blah. Like, um, how do I put this? He's much more crafty than anybody realizes. That's what I'll put. He's much more. Somebody brought up Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate. We've talked on DM a little bit. He is a master of psychology. Donald Trump, love him or hate him, was a master of psychology. So was Obama. Um, so was Bill Clinton. Most of the successful politicians are much more psychologists than politicians. Even AOC, if you're on the right, you probably hate AOC, right? If you're more left, you probably hate Donald Trump. You get in two peas of, in one pod. I mean, like these are two peas out of the same pod. These are, it's funny. I grew up, you know, not wealthy. My, my, I grew up in a mobile home. For my teenage years, I graduated high school living in a mobile home. So I wasn't dirt poor. Like I always had food, thank God. Um, But, you know, I was in a mobile home. So my best friend, Josh, we'd go to the trailer park to play basketball growing up in North Carolina. So I always had this thought that like the wealthy people, when I finally met them, they would be these genius numbers people. Like they would know numbers. Like you'd talk to them and they'd be like mathematicians. Like they'd be like, oh, I'm going to buy this deal. And, and, you know, the short interest on this deal is this. And, okay, I'm going to close out my position as a hedge fund quant. Like, no. Then I really meet billionaires. In the last – I on one of this trip last week, I bought bodybuilding with a guy who's a billionaire. I own the majority control of it. But he's a billionaire. He owns the Phoenix Suns. He's one of the owners. He's very sharp. The second you meet this guy – his, you can see he's reading the room very quickly. So I'll tell you, the real billionaire mind is two things. They have a speed chess mind. They're very quick. Um, in my life, I've met and interacted with eight billionaires that are like Forbes list people. Okay. People you all would know. Um, all of them have one thing, two things in common. Number one, they have extremely quick adapting mind. Like their mind bounces around really fast. They don't get locked on one thing. The second thing about them is that every single one of them is trying to read you very quickly. They're probing. They're asking questions. They're like, ah, okay, is Ty this? Is he dumb? Is he smart? And I think a lot of it's subconscious, by the way. Uh, I was just with Tillman Fertitta a couple months ago. Some of you might know him. He owns the Houston Rockets. He's worth about $7 billion. You meet Tillman, first time you meet him, he came to my house in, in Beverly Hills. And he, you could tell the purpose of that meeting was like, who is this Thai guy, right? So for each of you, not everybody in this game is going to become a billionaire. Let's have real talk, okay? It's just there's not enough money to go around for everybody to be a billionaire. 
But I do believe everybody on this earth can reach financial independence. And if you're a real player in the game, you can go way above average. You have to have those two traits, a quick mind that moves quickly and is always trying to assess the room, especially when you're in a new room. Somebody said Bill Gates is controlling you. Let me tell you something on that, not to get off the market. Less worry about Bill Gates, less worry about Dr. Fauci, less worry. That's not to say I like those guys. That's not what I'm saying. Listen very closely to what I'm saying because there's a nuance here. I'm not saying that Fauci, Obama, Hillary, Trump, all these people aren't important, but they're not that important in your life. I'll tell you what's important in your life. I guarantee you this, your own personal and individual skill. My mom loves conspiracy theories, so I hear them all from my mom. My mom thinks that they're putting, you know, she lives on one of my farms in the U.S., and she. Like, see that airplane? See the chemtrails? You know, they're manipulating the weather. They're dimming the sun. They're this. But meanwhile, most people are their own worst enemy. So, yeah, theoretically, the fucking government is your own worst enemy. Theoretically, they're messing with the farmers in the Netherlands. Yeah, yeah, I know all the conspiracy theories. They might be true. But I got one that I guarantee is true. If you have no skill, it's game over for you. So don't go deep down the rabbit hole of trying to expose every damn thing wrong in this world. First off, no shit that politicians are not the greatest people. If you don't know that, you need to become a history of a student of history. I mean, Julius Caesar was a politician. Do you think he was a great guy who had your best interests at heart? Do you think George Washington had your best interests at heart? Not really. George Washington was a great warrior. But he was a warrior when his chef ran away. He had a slave who had been his chef for 30 years and he finally ran away to freedom. George Washington hunted him down, even though he's the richest man in the world and could have another chef just to prove if you're my slave, you're mine forever. Like George Washington was an okay guy, but he ain't the greatest guy on earth. Abraham Lincoln. Okay. I mean, you think JFK, who was the great politician? Like move on. Like I get my brain just explodes and I feel bad for people. People are spending all that, all that trends on Twitter is basically sports, fucking music or something pop political, nothing worthwhile. I like sports, but I like to play them more than watch them. I do watch sports a little bit. I used to watch more. I'm so busy now. Like, I don't even, if you're busy, you ain't going to have that much time for sports. So at the end of the day, if you want to close deals, mind your own business. Of course, politicians are crooked. Of course, money runs the world. Money's been running. You know what runs the world? Resources. Go to African savanna. What's running the world is resources for lions, too. Everybody's trying to eat protein. You know, hippopotamus. So it's like humans are always thinking they're coming to these momentous revelations. Like, oh, Ty, I've discovered that, you know... (laughs) The Florida governor or the California governor is not a, the perfect guy. I'm like, is that what, how many years are you going to figure this out? If you're seven years old, maybe that's a great revolu- revelation for you. But if you want to fucking make money and get out there and set generational wealth up for your kids, your great grandkids, and so on and so forth, you better take 1% of your day to think about that. Like I stopped going on Twitter, even social media. Let me give you this advice for social media. Um, I don't get high off my own supply, meaning I limit myself to maximum 10 minutes a day on social media, but I hope other people spend a lot of time on my social media. It's kind of like being a drug dealer and maybe there, that's not the perfectly ethical way to explain it, but that's how the game goes. So your main interest in social media should not be to entertain yourself, but to entertain others. Someone said Ty has lost his mind. Possible possible. I think anybody that thinks through the game of life will slightly lose their mind. You lose your mind because in the end, um, the masses are distracting and confusing. And so, but we're programmed to be social animals. So therefore you will always lose your mind when you start thinking things through deeply because 
your inner DNA will want you to connect as a tribal person. We all have tribal DNA. So you want to be part of the tribe. But then when you realize the tribe is lost, there's an inner conflict that makes you kind of feel absurd or feel uh, conflicted. So it's a normal feeling. In, in fact, I, um, if I don't feel a little bit disenchanted with this world, then I know I'm on the wrong, wrong track. You know what I'm saying? So just, I just, the reason I was bringing up the whole political thing is some of you um, just mind your own business and make money. Now, that should not be your only goal in life. Health first. That's why I bought bodybuilding.com. I wanted people to know, like, I'm dedicated to health. I'd rather be less wealthy and keep my body fat. For a man, I think you should be at like 10 to 14%. You can cut lower and you can be a little bit bigger. But 10 to 14% is a great place to be. It's sustainable for a man. Um, if you want to be more of a power lifter, you go up to about 14%. Then you're strong but still lean enough for metabolic health. Um, if you want to get that kind of rip, you pull down to about 10%. Women is a whole different thing. Women generally, you don't want to be below 18% or your your hormones get fucked if you're trying to reproduce. You know, if you don't care about that, a woman can cut down like a man. But health first, wealth second. Now, by the way, this is not even the order of priority in terms of what's the most important thing in life. Because the most important thing in life is your health and your family. But the reason I put family third, so I do it health, wealth, love, happiness, because this is the sequence. Wake up in the morning, work out, health first. I, I met Arnold Schwarzenegger. I interviewed him in his house once in his kitchen. And um, I asked him, what's your daily routine? He's like, I wake up, I read for 45 minutes, and then I work out. So he does mental health first. He says, I read a book, newspapers from four. He wakes up at four in the morning, he told me. It's one of my old podcasts. Then he rides his bike to Gold's Gym in the be- at the beach. So he does health first. Then you come back from the gym, get to work. It's a good time and early, relatively early to get to work. Like I have, I'm the CEO of Retail E-Commerce Ventures, a company I started. And I have about 350 people who come on a daily Zoom who work for me, right? So I wake up, I do something health related, whether that's go on a walk, do some push-ups, whatever it is, okay? Then wealth second. Then if you take care of those two things, you have infinite, you have all life, a whole lifetime to enjoy friends, family, and romance. That's love. Friend, family, romance, I put in one. And if you do all of these, at the end, you will be left with happiness. So it's a sequential kind of game for me. But anyway, what I was saying, nowhere in there is politics, just to be clear. Unless your profession is to be a professional activist. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't vote. It's fine that people vote. Just don't concern yourself much with politics. Unless this is a dedicated part of your life that you're going to make money from. You will get fucked up. And all the people that I see that are like, no, Ty, I'm a patriot. Well, okay. You know the best way to be a patriot? Be a productive person. Start a business. That's that's what makes, you know what makes America great? All the entrepreneurs in America. That's what makes America great. The medical innovations, the technological innovations. This is the the agricultural innovations. And by the way, it doesn't all just come out of the United States. I'm not stuck on America. I spent half of my life outside of America um, because I like to be a balanced person. But somebody said prayer time. You could do that right when you wake up and right before you go to bed. If you're a Muslim, you're doing it five times a day. I was, where was I? I was in Dallas walking down the street. A Muslim dude was in the middle of the street with a, you know, with his prayer rug pointing towards Mecca. I'm like, great, disciplined person. Ain't no nothing wrong with that. That's all another. I'm not going to get into the God conversation, except to say there was a guy who wrote a song named Keith Green. He said, "Make your life a prayer." I always thought that was a good thing. Your whole life should be a damn prayer. Okay, your whole life should be a prayer. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't always have to be just something you do. At Sun Sunday. Anyway, it's not none of my business to talk about. All right, what's a quick Q and A? We'll go to bed. How about God, Ty? Not an expert on that. I'll leave that to other people. Am I in America now? Yes. What do I think about cryptocurrency? As I've said since the beginning, 
I told people in 2017 when crypto, when Bitcoin was at 4,500 and ETH was at 197. That's my first videos on my channel. Dollar cost average into things you believe in. Don't try to get rich fast. I launched my OG NFT. We're almost done with the restaurant we're building in Europe. Find things that have practical value. Don't speculate with crypto. If you do speculate with crypto, be prepared for pain. Some of you will have a reward. Most of you will have pain. So if you believe in crypto as a movement, stick with it. Um, so who runs Radio Shack Twitter? Yeah, we've done a lot of experiments. we got a crazy Twitter with Radio Shack. What do I think about Andrew Tate? He's a master of psychology. <laughs> someone said, someone said, tell Ty, tell us why you're not a fraud. You know, my, a lot of people, I'm a controversial person. Got a lot of social media followers early in the game, you know. I don't even try to fight controversy, man. I'll tell you the best thing I've heard Andrew Tate say is you should have about 30% of people mad at you and 70% of people love you. That's about my ratio. I've been doing that before anybody was. I was controversial before all these people nowadays. I never fought the controversy. Controver it's better to be controversial than forgotten about if you're trying to make money. Look at Elon Musk. You know how many people literally think he's some kind of Illuminati guy? How many people are pissed up to, at this new, um, he's been sued over and over by Tesla, people shorting him. Bill Gates is shorting him. He's got his literal billion dollar haters, people betting billions of dollars against him. Elon Musk was sued for slander. He's got all this recent stuff with women coming out about, but you know, he just proceeds and he stays cool under pressure. In terms of whether I'm a fraud, I think people thought I didn't know anything about business, you know. Um, let your action speak, man. I bought more companies in the last two years than basically any entity did. I bought more brands in the last two years than basically any private equity firm or any firm in, in the world did, especially on the retail side. So I just, all that stuff falls by the wayside. By the way, if somebody doesn't believe in you, nothing you say will convince them to believe in you. So when people who don't believe in me say stuff, then I'm like, prove me wrong. I'm like, I already know you're disqualified from me giving you my time. You know, you don't just move on, proceed. All you start to make money, you start closing a million dollar deal. I'm going to tell you this. First million dollar deal you do, someone in your family is going to probably take that money from you. You think I'm joking. <laughs> so sometimes the haters will come within the family. That's the one that'll take the wind out of you the most. That happened to me. Most of my family is awesome. The biggest thing that'll take the wind out of you is when you make your first million and somebody, either a close friend that you've known since childhood or God forbid, a family member, a cousin of this or that tries to take money from you. That'll be your biggest day of like, can you stay cool under pressure? And if you haven't had that, that moment yet, you ain't making money yet. <laughs> is that much? And the person you're dating or married to, um, they'll come for your money too. So um, I'm used to it by now. You know, I was making money before social media was out, man. What's my net worth? I'll tell you this. I bought networth.com and I'm going to post people's net worth. If you want, if you, who here would want me? I have a law firm that you can confidentially upload your financials to. And then they'll, without me seeing it at the website, you'll be able to have a verified badge on networth.com. So if your name's Bob Smith or Susie, you know, Susie Johnson, we'll have networth.com slash Susie Smith slash Bob Johnson, whatever. I don't know what names I should be using. Ethnic names. Bob Lopez. Um, We'll put a verified badge there. Most of the net worth stuff online is bullshit. Like I see there's some stuff that has my net worth at $10 million. So I'm I'll tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, try to have your net worth at 5 million, especially guys. If you're young and single, you want that net worth right at 5 mil. You don't want higher than 5 mil. There ain't no upside to it, but there's a lot of downside. If you're already married then whatever, if you're like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, you've been married a long time. You can have your net worth be whatever it is. What are my thoughts on investing in tech companies? Be careful with the stock market. 
stock market is more manipulated than everybody realizes. Somebody said, I lost friends when I made my first million. Yeah. What is Ty's ultimate goal? Where am I headed in the next five years? I like what I'm doing now, man. I'm like a Viking. I go in and I buy up stuff. I'm like a Viking raiding different countries. And some people might object to that. Fine. I'm not a virtue signaler, man. Some of you are really addicted to virtue signalers. You really follow people on social media who are like, I love my followers. I love you. <laughs> it's so funny how people fall for that. Anybody who tells me that I ain't never met that says they love me, I automatically don't uh, trust them. If I never met you and you fucking say you love me, come on, man. Who are you? Who is your audience? Morons? All of you who think some social media influencer lives their life for you. But I will tell you, I respect the people who follow me and these conversations I have. I don't love you because why should I love? I need to conserve my love for the people who love me back in action. You know, Sigmund Freud has a great book called Civilization and His Discontents, by the way. That is the same. If I only had one book to give my children and I knew they would understand it, it would be chapter two of civilization and its discontents. It's the greatest one chapter I've ever read by any human. Anyway, he, he asks, he says, he basically says it's disingenuous to say you love everybody because he said, by definition, love is a scarce resource because love takes time to be expressed. So if you love everybody, then you don't have time to love your children or your brother or your cousin or your mom who gave birth to you. You know what I'm saying? Will you come to my wedding? <laughs> Is Ty and Tate collab coming soon? People are asking me that a lot. Dude, I'm not even on social media much right now. I'm literally spending 16 hours a day running companies and buying companies. Like I said, I just bought bodybuilding.com, merging into my existing businesses. You know, I've got hundreds and hundreds of people who work for me. I've got six offices around the world. I've got Manhattan, Miami, London, Copenhagen, Stockholm, Serbia. I was just there. We have an office in Bolivia. We have an office in Puerto Rico. We're opening up Utah. So I'm just busy right now. You know what I mean? Somebody said, where will I retire? <laughs> I like to be everywhere, man. I like to be everywhere. I like, I rotate around in all the places that I have offices. I spend time in Copenhagen, Stockholm, London, Manhattan. I was just in Manhattan. So somebody said, can I work in the mall? Where do I live right now? I mean, I live between Puerto Rico. I have my farms in the U.S. too. I've got about 1,300 acres of organic farms. That was my true love, man. Do I have a personal jet? Um, you know, I've been trying to buy a jet for a couple of years. It's so much easier for me to just charter a jet whenever I needed it. So last week I had to go to six cities in two days. I just chartered a jet. Right now it's really hard to get pilots. All the pilots are getting sucked up by the airlines. So if you buy a jet, there's a risk that you don't have a damn um, pilot. So you got a $10 million jet just sitting there and you can't fly it. Ty is the original <laughs> Andrew Tate. <laughs> Ah, what a world, man. Social cracks me up. I Closing deals. How do we do it? So here's my advice to all of you. If you don't like how much money you make, get out there and close deals. If you don't know what to sell, go sell somebody else's stuff on commission. I promise you, lots of you can make six figures this year. And some of you make six figures a month. If I lost all my money, I'm going straight back to sales. At the end of the day, if you know how to read people, if you understand the modalities of sales, if you understand the PACE system, P-A-S-E, practical, action, social, emotional, if you're empathetic and willing to take the time, if you ain't lazy, you can make money through everything. You can make money through. If COVID happens again and they shut down the world, you could still be closing deals on the phone. If you live in Nigeria or Australia or Bhutan right now and you're watching this, you can be cut closing deals around the world. It's the ultimate way to chase money. If you uh, are concerned that you already know how to make a million bucks, the only way you'll go from a million to 10 million for the most part is if you can close deals. You know, Thoughts on real estate. Look, the only thing I don't like about real estate 
I'm not a big fan of doing stuff that I show up at a deal and there's 40 other people. Right now I'm negotiating to buy a public company. This is a public company. I'm not going to give much info because some of you might be able to identify it. And, but this is a business doing more than four or five hundred million dollars. Okay. Um, somebody said Ty's got a dad body, but he's not married. Do I, is it my angle? Do I look like I got a dad bod? Um, <laughs> my net worth is 10 million G's. Is that what my net worth is? 10 million? I think it's a little higher than that. Wait, God, there's like different websites. Is it, is it say 10 million now? I remember at one point it said 60 million. Someone said Ty does not have a dad body chest. El Salvador. Someone talking about Bitcoin. Um, so I'm starting, I, if I lose all my money, I'm going to sell stuff. If you all are broke, start selling. Now sales and what? What would I sell? Well, I have a lot of people who follow me who sell solar stuff. That solar stuff is a great thing because you're actually, those deals are financed. Believe it or not, one of my um, interns went on and he did car sales. He was making 400000 He made $400,000 last year. A guy from the ghetto, New York City, Staten Island from the projects. Last year, he made $400,000 selling cars. That might not be your dream job for life, but you make $400,000 for three or four years. You save your money. You can take that capital and go out and deploy it. He's now buying his first piece of real estate. Um, so I think life insurance is good. Health insurance is good. Cars, selling um, solar and energy. I think real estate, becoming a realtor, you can do it. I think if you're more advanced, you can do what I do. Go buy companies that are for sale. I love to. Somebody said, Ty, I hate you, but nobody's going to close deals. At some point, they'll want a holiday without contract. Oh, I don't even know what that means. You got bad grammar, so I don't understand what you're saying. Somebody said, Caballero, he has houses all over the world. I got lots of assets all over the world. Don't worry about me. I'm good, man. I could have retired a long time ago, a decade. But I like the game, man. I'm a chess player. My grandpa was a chess master. Um, and so I like the game. And um, But don't worry about me. I'm okay. 60-30-10 rule. You should have 60% of your net worth in one area, 30% of your net worth in a secondary, and then you should have about 10% of your net worth um, in something ancillary. So I have e-com and tech. That's my big one, 60%. Then crypto you can have is 30 or 10, and then real estate. I think those are the three big categories that people are interested in. E-commerce or technology, right? Number two, real estate or chess, uh, or chess, or real estate or um, crypto. And then you can put the third, uh, you can put the actual third category. So for me, I like farmland. I've been buying up, I got about 1300 acres of farmland. I actually am closing a deal this month. It's a small deal. It's only 55 acres, but it, it one of my pieces of property, it adjoins, it's got a couple houses on it and stuff. So I'll be at a, almost 1400 acres. This year, um, I bought, been buying land in West Texas. So I just bought not much. Uh, I've got about 400 acres. And that, I'm not counting that in because that's not land that I farm. We flip it. So that's a great way. Flipping real estate is a great way to use sales skills. Great way. You, can, you go, what we do is we send out letters to people and we say, we're willing to if you need to sell uh, your property, here's a price we're willing to give you. Or if you want to negotiate, call us back. For every about 10,000 um, letters, uh, sorry, for every thousand letters you send back, your pro if you send them out targeted, for every, you'll probably get, let's just say roughly, you know, 10 serious responses. And if you know how to close deals and read people, you should be able to close one. So it's great conversion rate. A thousand letters cost you nothing. The harder part is targeting them. You know what I'm saying? Someone said international real estate is the way to go. Yeah, I'm actually looking. I looked at some farms when I was in Denmark and Sweden. The thing about Sweden is a very interesting place, you know. 
why do people misunderstand about visualizations and affirmations? Um, let me talk about that. Second. Where can I learn sales skills? I just launched a little beta program that I'm putting together on my website, tylopez.com. You can go, I'm putting together all my top sales stuff. So I'm not live to try to sell you all something, but if you're asking tylopez.com, I've got a little, I've got a sales system. I'm just, I just recorded the first video for it while I was on this flight. It was crazy. You know, what's crazy now you can do zoom calls while you're in a jet 30,000. Like that technology is new. Two years ago, if you tried to zoom, I closed the bodybuilding deal over the Atlantic ocean. It was insane. I did the DocuSign in the closing call to buy bodybuilding.com. This is a big business. This did, this is a nine figure business doing over hundred million bucks a year. Um, and then on this last little trip last week, I was able to, I was, I did a Microsoft teams on a private jet. That's new. Two years ago, the, it was too slow and I did video. So it was pretty interesting. So I'm getting married soon. How do you feel about prenups? <laughs> One of my brothers is in a little bit of war with his girlfriend about, she doesn't want to sign a prenup. Um, marriage, what a concept nowadays, right? One thing interesting in Sweden, not many people get married anymore, man. Um, I would say if you got a lot of money, it's not a big deal if you sign a prenup. If somebody's marrying you because they love you, they shouldn't care if they have to sign a prenup. You know what I'm saying? If you're both broke, then it might be weird to sign a prenup. Like if you're both broke, and by the way, this goes both ways for men or women. Like if a woman's rich, you may want to prenup on a dude. And if he won't sign it, that's a bad sign. I think it's a bad sign if somebody won't sign a prenup. Once again, if you're both broke, I think it's weird if you bring up a prenup. Because what are you protecting? <laughs> a prenup is basically saying the assets you had before marriage. So is risk the down payment to success? You know, they actually did a study. The average entrepreneur takes less risk than you think. The key thing to remember about an entrepreneur is they do timed risk. So the average entrepreneur is not taking risk at all most of the time and then suddenly doubles down and takes a whole bunch of risk all at once. Been training jujitsu. Man, I haven't done as much jujitsu because a lot of it shut down like during COVID. I was training with the Puerto Rico group here. You know, I was training with some of the top schools here, but they moved to Austin. So somebody said, are you fucking real, Ty? Oh, I'm a hologram. What are some questions? If I have major swag, does that translate to big cash money stacks? <laughs> uh, if you want the science on it, in general, um, narcissism, a little bit of narcissism is positively correlated with wealth. But I'll tell you, you go too far with that narcissism, it'll backfire on you. So be careful. Don't be too much of a narcissist. Pretty much everyone in society is a little bit of a narcissist now. We all got social media. We're all posting selfies. You think my grandma will ever want to post a selfie? Like my grandma was from a different time. She was born during World War One, man. She wasn't into that. So I think swag can be overplayed. I'll tell you this, closing deals and reading people. If you If you have too much swag, remember when you start closing big deals, I'm talking about deals where 10 to $100 million is on the line. Everybody in that room already knows about money. So if you get too cocky, they're like, bro, we're already rich too. So chill the fuck out. See what I'm saying? So when you're doing small deals, you're going to feel like, the, you know, you're the king. That's just because you're hanging out with a whole bunch of newbies. You, you don't have to push it too far. Why do I invest in farmland? Because I know one thing, no matter what happens, everybody's going to need food. Everybody's going to need food, man. Have I ever looked into indoor vertical farms? Yes, but I do believe it's a big mistake to think that you don't need to have your plants with roots in real soil. I don't believe in hydroponics like most people do. It's not natural, man. I, pl I have a field, 30 acres of alfalfa, uh, organic alfalfa for hay. Those roots go down 
up to 15 minute, uh, 15 feet deep. How are you, they're pulling up trace minerals that scientists haven't even uh, discovered yet. And you're going to tell me I can just stick them in a little potted soil like this where chemicals, it's a little bit like not nursing your kids and just saying, oh, well, I'll just give my kids baby formula. Fuck that. I'm not a believer in that. So I think vertical farming is overgrown, uh, 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 is oversold, probably just like, you know, plant burgers are probably oversold. Web3 meta thoughts. You know, Web3 is here to stay. Most of the people doing Web3 aren't good entrepreneurs, and that's why everything's crashing right now. Soon, better entrepreneurs with more experience will come into crypto and stuff won't crash so much. What you're seeing now is necessary evil of the beginning of an industry, the beginning of a movement, and you have a lot of ding dong people in crypto, unfortunately, running it. Trust me. It's a lot of amateurs. I'm not even saying that to put anybody down. I'm just telling you the facts on the ground. I meet people that are running big crypto businesses and I'm like, this business is going to fail because this person knows nothing about business, you know? How long do you plan on buying businesses for? I don't know. You kind of get addicted to buying. Doing deals is fun, man. What's up with the hair? I got a lot of comments on the hair. You know what's interesting? No women complain about it, but a lot of men do. But since I know my target market and it's not men, I ignore the men. Focus on your target market, ladies and gentlemen. It's a big mistake. You know what a big mistake? If I could go back in time, dudes get... Dudes get advice on looks from their buddies who's not their target market. I'm like, this is dumb. You ever heard of a focus group? You fill up a focus group with the people that you want to convince. President of Ecuador is working with so many crypto experts. There ain't so many crypto experts in this world. Sheila Gallo said, Ty, you're handsome. Don't listen to them. Thank you, Sheila. Sheila. <laughs> when when a lot of women tell you to cut your hair, then cut your hair. Unless your target market's dudes, then you're good. Ty, I've been following you for nine years, and I hit two million last year. Thanks for all your courses. Awesome. Congratulations, man. Congratulations. Or, I'm not sure, male or female. I have a lot of female entrepreneurs following me, too. Can you talk about getting into art? Here's the problem with the art business. And I believe the art business is a very valid business. So I'm just telling you the truth on the downside here about art. One, it's um, when people are struggling financially, they're just so worried about paying the rent and food that they don't have a lot of money to spend on things like art. And so what happens is that art is a very cyclical business. So I hope that each of you that as an artist realize it's a tough business, but there is a way to succeed, but it is cyclical. So when you make money, make sure you save some of your damn money because when times get tough, people stop buying art. It's just how the game's been for hundreds of years, by the way, that's not even new box art. You know, all these people were, um, Mozart, Beethoven, some of these people struggled in the 17 and 1800s, because when it's, if you look at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, when people are struggling for the bottom of the Maslow hierarchy, which is food, shelter, water, they don't drop any money on food, uh, on art. So be real careful because art is a cyclical business. So save all your pennies when you make that money on the upswing. And there's other industries for sure that are also like that. Okay. All right. Well, I think I'm going to go. It's an hour and 10 minutes. What am I currently reading? It's on the phone here. I'll show you. I got some iBooks. I love iBooks now because I travel so much. I can just pull them up. Here's a good iBook. I'm reading The Power of Regret by Daniel Pink. What a good book. Who here has heard? Here's The Power of Regret. Who here has heard this thing that no regrets? Who's ever said no regrets? If you think it's healthy to have no regrets, you should read this book by Daniel Pink, one of the top scientists alive. Don't go down that. 
route. It's a big mistake to not have regrets. Would you tell your children to never have regrets? If your kid puts the hand in the fire and burns themselves, permanent skin damage, would you be like, no regrets, keep doing it, fuck that. No, 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 no. It's great to have regrets. The main problem is some people get so paralyzed by their regrets, they never move on. So what's healthier to do, by the way, people get tattoos that say no regrets. The irony is about 40% of people who get tattoos regret them. So <laughs> not everybody, but it's a, I, I don't, it's a, it's an ironic, but the power of regret is a book I'm reading. It's called how looking backwards moves us forward. That's the subtitle. Yeah. Jeff Bezos has that framework. His framework is called regret minimalization framework. And it's made him almost the wealthiest person ever to live. So it's okay to have regrets. Just don't get stuck on the, uh, on regrets. Don't be paralyzed by regrets, but certainly ponder your mistakes. Ponder your mistakes deeply. Think on them deeply. <laughs> Someone said, Ty, I regret not listening to you more. Okay. Yeah, no regrets. Anyone ever seen We Are... Who's ever seen We Are the Millers, that movie? What's my biggest regret? So my biggest regrets financially would probably be... I should have moved into SaaS software earlier. That's something I wish I had done. And... um building a big sales floor. I know a lot about sales. I can coach a lot of people. So that's, I'm building a sales floor now. Um, what are other regrets? I mean, I had other, I think I should have lifted weight. You know, my dad was a pro bodybuilder. I was so busy as an entrepreneur. I would have, if I regret that I would change, if I had a time machine, I would have lifted more seriously for my entire life. I did it more on and off. Um, other regrets. Believe it or not, some of the stuff I did right, I still regret not doing more. I would have had more mentors. Mentors, man. I've had a lot of mentors. I still didn't have enough. Every area you want to get good on, find a mentor to like skip five years of mistakes. So that's one. I would have gotten more mentors um, around almost every area of business. Around, I would have got more. Diet is a great place to get mentors because they. Were, it's not just that... They tell you what to eat, but you emulate them. Diet is hard in the modern world, man. There's a ton in the in this world of crappy food now. It's almost impossible to escape bad food. And so you really need good mentors when it comes to like food, diet, self-control, sleep, simple stuff. Um, what's other regrets? I always think most people should live in another country. You're going to really regret that you always lived like where you were born. It doesn't mean you can't go back to where you were born, but you should live in another culture, whether that's India, you know, Japan, Nigeria, like go far away and live at least for a portion of your life. So I think my biggest regrets, like I said, financially, I should have done I should have built SaaS software. Now I got a lot of SaaS software. I've got a competitor to Amazon that's out called Brahms. We just launched last Tuesday. We've got 75 programmers working for me, building code. So that tech is where you get the best multiples. Buying companies, I should have bought companies earlier. Um, apparently I'm decent at it and I should have started it. I'll tell you your biggest regrets will find out, be finding out you had a strength that you didn't do earlier. That's the most annoying thing. Cause some stuff you think you want to do and then you realize you suck at it. So you don't have regrets. Like I know people that want to be actors and then they go to acting school and they suck. And I'm like, you're not going to have any regret that you didn't spend the last 10 years being an actor. Cause you are not good at it. So for me, your biggest regrets are realizing you are good at something naturally but you started 10 years too late on it. That That's what will haunt you in life. So one of the things to do, some of you are young, you know, you're like teenagers, do a lot of stuff. Try everything for like three months. Do like 67 days in real estate, 67 days in door-to-door -door sales, 67 days. I like 67 days because that's the average time. It takes somebody to develop a new habit. Try 67 days as a personal trainer. Try 67 days as like a flight attendant, like anything. Now, obviously that takes a little more training, but 
anything you can get your hands into, try for like three years of your life, let's say 18 months of your life, two 18 month cycles, that's 36 months, try like 15 things, two, three months at a time. Some people like be an Uber driver, be a bodyguard, be a bouncer, start and try to start a nightclub, start a model agency. Like if you think you can sing, spend two and a half months, move to Hollywood and try to go to 20 auditions in two months. So I also think your biggest regrets will be not experimenting enough. Like People are like, Ty, do you, uh, someone said, Ty, your biggest regret is not being humble. No, that's not my biggest regret. I, I actually, as cocky as people think I am, I would tell my 18 year old self to be way more cocky, not annoyingly cocky. Not annoyingly cocky, just internally, like, fuck that. I, sometimes you need a little bit of Kanye West swag. Kanye's like, whatever I go after, I dominate. I don't think you always have to say that to everybody because it's annoying to just yell that out to everybody. But inwardly, nah, I would rather, I would advise myself to increase my cockiness. I don't think you should be arrogant, but a little cockiness goes a long way, man. I do not, you know, there's something called Dunning Kruger effect, which is two scientists Dunning and Kruger found when people are intelligent, they usually doubt themselves too much. Now I will tell you, some of you watching might be a little bit too far on the other side. You might be a little too, it is possible to be too fearless. There are people that are too fearless. It's just not that common. It's not as common as you think. P Diddy going to make it happen. P Diddy's, Pretty cocky dude and has done pretty well, man. But I'll tell you this. That's just his public persona. I guarantee you, I don't know, P. Diddy, if you got behind the scenes, that dude is doing a lot of stuff besides just being cocky. That's not his pathway to success. Uh, no way. No way that P. Diddy. It, he's, I bet you P. Diddy listens to smart people more than anyone you and I have ever met. You don't get on the top like that. You don't get on the top like that with that. I'll tell you this. Be cocky, but listen to other people. That, that, that's probably the perfect, perfect blend. The second you're cocky, but don't listen to smart people, you're going to get wrecked. So be cocky, but listen to sharp people. Yeah, P. Diddy learns from Ray Dalio. I'm sure P. Diddy has all these people that are at the top of the game, you know, talking to him. So, all right. Ty, how can you recall everything you read? I don't recall everything I read, but a good thing to do is make a little YouTube channel. You can even make private videos. And just after you read a book, try to teach it back to yourself. Put the videos on private if you're shy. Leave them to your kids in 20 years. Say, hey, here's a, here's the top 100 books I read in a little video me explaining. It'd be a great gift to your children, man. Powerful gift to your children. And with modern video, it might last for generations. Wouldn't it be? I wish I could see a video of my great, great, great grandfather. Like that'd be insane. The value just to see. So all the video we have now, use it for, you know, use it for good. All right. Thank you all. I'll talk to you soon.